Hey guys, this is part three of our correlation lecture. In this video, we want to actually see how to calculate the Pearson correlation coefficient. <coughs> so I'm going to show it to you in PowerPoint here in this particular video. Um, so I'll use the tables that correspond to an example that's in the textbook, so you can easily follow along if you want to look back in the textbook. But then I'll also make a separate video where I'll use um, data from the uh, homework assignment itself um, or related data to the homework assignment itself. And I will do one like I did for descriptive statistics where you can see me hand calculate the entire thing. Okay, so without further ado, let's get started. Um, now, it, it's worth noting that there are multiple ways of calculating a um, Pearson correlation coefficient, right? There's several different formulas you can use. So this is just two examples of them. There's, a, in fact, at least a third or fourth method. <clears throat> and it's entirely possible that you have taken statistics elsewhere or that you seek external help for either from a tutor or, or Google searches or things like that. I want to point out that those other methods, while they are acceptable outside of this classroom, they are unfortunately not acceptable inside of this classroom because I need all of us to use the exact same method so that it's easier for me to identify when you've made an error so that I can fix that error and help guide you along to calculating it properly. So again, this may inconvenience one or two of you who have learned a different method, but I promise you this new method is quite easy. So <clears throat> um, I point this out specifically because in an earlier version of your textbook, Actually, I think the first and potentially even the second edition of that textbook, they used a different method. So they used this method with z-scores. You can see out of these two formulas, the one that's in the sort of center of the screen, r equals the sum of the z of x times the z of y divided by n. Okay, that will get you the Pearson correlation coefficient. We are not going to be using that one, okay? So don't use that method. Instead, we're going to use r is equal to the sum of score minus the mean of those scores for the x variable, multiply those times the y minus the mean of the y variable, um, add all of those products together, and then divide by the square root of sum of squares x times sum of squares y. So the reason why I like this formula is not because it looks more complicated, and, it, and although it does look more complicated, you'll see it's actually functionally equivalent. It's, it's really easy. It's because these are things you know. You've been doing already in order to get standard deviation and variance, score minus the mean of those scores, right? And that's what x minus the mean of x is. You just have to do it for the x variable, and you have to do it for the y variable. We've already done sums of squares, so you know how to do that as well, right? And so this formula really takes advantage of things that you already know how to do, though. So I think that's one of its major wins. Okay, so we're going to be calculating... Um, Pearson correlation coefficients, technically we will be treating these data as a population. So when you calculate standard deviation, I want you to use the same formula we have used before. Um, so technically that would be referred to as rho or a different um, Greek character. But we're going to keep calling it R because that's familiar for correlations, <clears throat> even though that technically denotes a sample. Okay, so let's look um, at some data that comes straight from the textbook um, so we can talk about it and you can follow along. Ask whether or not um, skipping class, essentially, attendance and exam grades are related. So we have these data here. Notice the first column, that is simply identifying a student by number instead of name because data are anonymous, right? It's a, that's not data. That's not a column we're going to analyze in any way because it's arbitrary. It'd be like yeah, finding out the average of your name and my name or something like that. Um, instead, the data we're interested in is that column in the middle, absences. Right, where we see all the absences across an entire semester for all, each of these 10 individual students. And then the column on the right, exam grade. Right? These two columns are the data we want to see if they are in fact correlated. Right? So to blow it up a little bit more so you can see it there, we see that that student number one has four absences and an exam grade of 82. And down there at student number eight, they had eight absences and an exam grade of only 58. We want to know whether or not there's a trend or a relationship here, right? Is it the case that as one goes up, the other one goes up? So what would you predict? If absences increases, what do you predict would happen with exam grades? Would they tend to also increase such that individuals with lots of absences also tend to have higher exam grades? That would be a positive correlation, right? Because it would also mean that those with a few absences have lower exam grades, many absences, higher exam grades. Or do you think it might be a negative correlation where these two variables move in opposite directions, right? As one increases, so absences goes from zero up to eight, then exam grade tends to go the other direction, starting up high when absences are zero and getting very low when absences grow. That would probably be the prediction. Now can we find that, right? So 
the basic steps of correlation. I think this first one technically I would consider optional, right? So that caveat, not always necessary. If say the professor says so, or if you're using software like SPSS or SAS, there's no reason to look at the correlation um, scatter plot first. Just go ahead and look at the data, and then if you need to, look at the scatter plot afterwards. Okay, so I'm going to claim it as optional for now, but I'm going to do it anyway to show you. So if I took those exam grades and I said that absences is our x variable, uh, because we want to see whether or not that predicts in some way exam grades. So we'll treat exam grades as our y variable, right? So we have an x and a y. We want to then plot those pairs, right? Remember, those belong to an individual, so you can't mix those up. You can't take the exam grade of 58 that was written next to eight absences and pair it up there with the person who had zero absences, right? They, they belong together here. So just keep track as you're copying data, say, from one table to another or something like that. Um, so let's take the x, y data and plot it in a scatter plot. Here's what we see. Now, if we were to try and draw a line through here, I think we would all basically agree that while it's not a very steep line, that line would be going sort of down and to the right, right? When it's downhill slopes like that, that means that the y-axis decreases as the x-axis increases. It means they're going in opposite directions, which means the scatter plot is at least visually confirming our prediction that we might have a negative correlation. It also, more importantly, shows us whether or not that relationship appears to be linear, right? If these data were curvilinear or there appeared to be no pattern whatsoever, just dots all over the place and no line, then we probably wouldn't bother to continue calculating a correlation coefficient. But in this case, we're definitely justified. It looks pretty linear to me. Okay, so the next step then, we're going to work on the numerator of that equation, all right? Basically taking the score, the x, minus the mean of x, and we're going to do that for an x variable, then we're going to do it for the y variable. We'll put it in a nice table to keep track of it all. So let's, let's look at that um, equation again so we can see what that numerator actually is. <coughs> Excuse me. So remember, the numerator here, the sum of, we'll get to that in a minute, what are we doing on the inside of these parentheses, because that's where PEMDAS always starts, right, with a P. So in the inside of that first one, x minus the mean of x. Inside of the second one, y minus the mean of y. That's easy. We're calling absences x, we're calling exam grades y. Let's figure out those averages and subtract off all of those averages from those scores. Okay, so we get a bare table here. Now we've got absences. Let's throw in a column for score minus the mean of that score. And then let's do exam grades and then score minus the mean of that score. And then lastly, because the numerator of our correlation coefficient asks us to multiply the one column times the other, let's put that in there as well. So first, let's figure out the absences. Add all of those together, divide by 10, because there's 10 individuals in the class here, we would get a mean of 3.400, okay? The book goes all the way to three decimal places at times, so I'm just using their data at the moment. Um, now let's subtract 3.4 from all of those absences, okay? Oh, let's quickly get the exam grade average, 76, right? So add all those up, divide by 10. Now let's subtract 3.4 from all of those X's, right? All of those absences. We get all of these values now, right? 4 minus 3.4 is 0 0.6. 3 minus 3.4 is negative 0.4, right? Let's do the same thing for y now. Subtract 76 from all of those exam grades. We now have these sort of deviations, if you will, the degree to which that score deviates or is different from the mean. And in which direction? Is it below it? Is it above it? Now, because the numerator requires it of us, let's multiply these two columns together, and we get this last sort of cross product column product column. Now be careful when you do this, okay? It's very easy to pass your eyes across and sort of go from one row down to the other one and accidentally instead of multiplying, let's say this as would be correct, negative 1.4 times 0, you look just slightly off and you multiply 0.6 times 23. Or another error I see sometimes is actually using the x or the y data instead of these columns for x uh, minus mean of x and y minus the mean of y. So what I suggest you do while you're working at home, you're handwriting these out, and I'll show you that in my other video is just to highlight that whole column after you fill it out. So after you get the x minus the mean of x, grab your yellow highlighter and highlight the hell out of the entire column. Then do y minus the mean of y, write all those scores down, and highlight the hell out of that one. Then when it comes time to fill out this last column here, you will always be able to keep track of which data you're looking at. You still have to be careful going from x to y columns, but as long as that eliminates the possibility of going to the wrong column, you've eliminated at least one source of error.
right? So finally, multiply all these things together, and then the very, very last step for the numerator, right? This is simple math, is that sigma on the outside, so add them all up. You get a 304, right? A negative 304. Now I'm going to highly recommend, just like I do for standard deviation and variance, that every time you hand calculate these sorts of things, you double check especially those summation steps. Okay, it's very, very easy when you're entering a lot of data into your calculator one at a time, over and over and over again, that you just simply say, put a decimal in the wrong place, or you forget to hit a negative sign, or, or any number of tiny little errors that can take place there that can throw your last answer off. If it's off, well, a double check usually will catch that because you're unlikely to make the exact same error twice. Okay, so again, just a piece of advice as far as I'm concerned. So let's write that in. It's negative 304 now for the numerator. So we're halfway done. Right? We have half of our correlation already complete. See, I told you, the math in this class is stupidly easy. It's just tedious. Okay, so the denominator. Now we need to create those sums of squares. SSX and SSY. So a sum of squares for each of those variables. Well, that's pretty easy. We were actually already almost there. Remember, we did X minus the mean of X just on the last slide. That means all we have to do to get the sum of squares is to square all of those values. Remember, the sum of squares are the square deviations. We've got the deviations. Let's square them, right? So that x minus the mean of x, we just square all of that, and we square all the y minus the mean of y. We're really just adding two more columns, columns that you're used to from standard deviation, right? And so let's do it. x minus the mean of x, y minus the mean of y. Not a problem. Now what do we need to do? It says we need to find the sums of squares and then multiply them. So let's add them up and get the sums of squares. 56.4 for the sum of squares x. 2,262 for the sum of squares y. And now it says the next step is to multiply those sums of squares. We can see that in the equation, right? So let's do that. Sum of squares x, sum of squares y. That was 56.4, 2,262. We are then going to multiply them together, and we get 127,576.8. Last, last step to finishing the denominator, take the square root. So the square root of this big-ass number gives us 357.18. And you can see the equation is basically done. We have r equals negative 304 divided by 357.18. So... Divide numerator by denominator, we get a correlation of negative 0.85. It is a negative correlation, which is what we thought it was going to be and what the scatter plot suggested it would be. Uh, this is not exactly where the line probably would end up. I didn't calculate that ahead of time, but you can sort of see a downward slope, a negative correlation. So go watch it again if you have to, and then practice it. Go find a problem, practice it, or use these data and do them on your own. And then anytime you have an error, go back and look at the video so you can see exactly where that error occurred, right? Practice is going to make awesome in this case. So keep it up. And uh, we got one more video left really about applications of correlation and a few cautions with uh, how to interpret the, the data that you get. All right, cheers.